Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our second lecture on the structure of the sport industry. When we finished our lecture on Monday, which was our introduction to management lecture, we had a brief look at the global structure of the sport industry, and we identified a couple of governing bodies that were quite essential in that structure. I believe we look at the following diagram. Um, if only my slides would comply and do as I tell them to do. There we go. All right, so we looked at this structure at the end of our last lecture, and we spoke briefly about some of these governing bodies, namely the GAISF, IOC, and a few others. So we're going to go a little bit deeper into a few of them today, starting, of course, with um, those highlighted in orange there. So let's look at the Global Association of International Sports Federation, the GAISF. This is basically the mother body of all global sport bodies, and it is a, it, all other international governing bodies have to be affiliated with the GAISF in order to be functional. Its primary aim or its primary goal is to promote the members who are the international governing bodies of each sport code, as well as IOC included in that um, net. And then coming down, and I've selected just a few of the big ones, I've looked at FIFA. Okay, so this is a governing body that we are all familiar with, uh, particularly in the years when we have the World Cup, like this year we're going or heading towards the World Cup. So this body is quite big, has a huge income and a huge impact in the sport industry worldwide or globally. It's responsible for organizing football, okay, as well as the Football World Cup. And it's also responsible for ensuring the compliance of national associations. Now, this is typical of all international governing bodies. They all have the responsibility of ensuring that the national governing bodies of their member nations are compliant with the rules and regulations of that particular uh, sport code. Now, FIFA is housed in Switzerland. And a lot of other federations, I think, are also housed in Switzerland, apart from cricket, which I think has moved to Dubai, if I'm not mistaken, uh, because for tax reasons, just to, to try and manage um, tax payments for the federation. So this is a typical international governing body and what it stands for and how it influences the local governing bodies that we have in our countries. So FIFA, for example, has 209 member countries represented who are affiliated with FIFA, including Zimbabwe. And the IOC is also the over, overall governing body for the Olympic Games. We have ZOC, which is our, our local governing body, but the IOC is also based in Switzerland and governs national and international sporting federations. So the IOC is a little bit different because under their affiliation, you will find that there are also minor sporting codes that are not really that recognized internationally. So they will also govern a few of those um, sport codes. And then we move on to the World Anti-Doping Agency, WADA for short. This is an independent governing body that was formed in 1999. Now, the reason why this body was formed is to try and curb cheating and unfairness in sport. It was discovered that some athletes were taking some substances to enhance their performance, which was then um, hindering the sportsmanship or the whole mentality of sport. So that, that could not be allowed because sport has to maintain its integrity. It has to maintain its structure, its culture, and its identity in order for it to be relevant in the industry as well as in the society. So WADA was then formed to curb those cheating um, attempts as well. Right, so WADA is an independent governing body. That means it is not 
um, housed under any sporting federation or any sporting code. It is funded by the governments of the world or any government really that has a sporting code or a sporting um, interest internationally. And their main objective, like we said, is to create a doping free sporting environment. So what is interesting is that the more WADA identifies doping techniques and mechanisms that are used in sport, like they, they take out drugs, um, they've also discovered that people are advancing and changing their means of doping. There is what is called blood doping, mostly in cycling and in athletics. People have been found to be blood doping. So what they do is they will have some of their blood drained or transfused out of their bodies. And then that blood is then given, transfused back into them uh, prior to an event. So this allows them to have extra oxygen intake in that moment and, and allows them to perform a little bit better or a little to endure a little bit longer than their counterparts. So it is a form of doping and has been discovered by WADA. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to, to, to find out how they are countering this type of doping, but it's become prevalent in the last few years. Another interesting form of doping that was prevalent perhaps in the 2000 and uh, when was the last Olympics? Um, I forget now. All right, perhaps the Olympics that were held in London or Rio, I'm not so sure anymore, but it became uh, public knowledge that some athletes or some female athletes would get pregnant and go to the Olympics while well, their fetus is just at in, in the first trimester because that allowed them, in fact, their bodies would then have an increased oxygen uptake to cater for the foreign body growing within them. So that allowed them to perform better than their counterparts. And then immediately after they, they've competed in the Olympic games, they would then have an abortion. So that became another form of doping that was discovered. So it's quite interesting to try and, and find out how far these athletes would go to perform better than their counterparts. It doesn't make any sense because at the end of the day, it's amoral and very unethical uh, practices that they are doing to try and get that one leg up over their counterparts. Now, I want to say have a discussion about this because I think it's very interesting and maybe try to identify some forms of doping um, that are prevalent, perhaps in Zim as well. Uh, I've identified one there, the Russian athletics scandal. That's a very big controversy where the Russian Athletics Federation was found to be um, encouraging their athletes to dope and has been banned from the Olympics since 2012, correct me if I'm wrong. But they're still not in, they're still not back in. And this matter was at CAS a couple of years ago, and it's still not working out for the Russian Federation. So it's, it's a big deal. Perhaps you could also find and, and discuss some other doping controversies that you're aware of. One thing that I've heard about in Zim that seems to be quite a big deal is age cheating. Could that be a, a form of doping? Do you think that could be classified under doping, where do you think it fits in when people lie about their ages? Because, I mean, they obviously produce more testosterone or better hormones and perform a little bit better than people who are younger than them. Um, could that then be seen as a form of doping? I don't know. We, I think, should have this discussion on the WhatsApp group and see um, what your thoughts are. All right. So, Anti-doping in Zim works a little bit differently. In South Africa, they do have a South African Anti-Doping Association. In Zimbabwe, on the other hand, anti-doping is housed within the Zimbabwe Olympic Committee. So they have a different section for anti-doping rules or within their framework, they encompass the anti-doping rules and how they deal with doping situations within the country. Um, doping, conditions, punishments, ideals, and, and what's right and what's wrong are normally subject to the country's laws. So 
they will be different from country to country. There is no one size fits all. For example, in some countries, marijuana is legal. In other countries, it's illegal. Um, but where does water stand with that? I think marijuana is a no-no. I think it's one of the banned drugs, if I'm not mistaken. I think in, in car sports and in weightlifting, I'm not sure about the other sports. So how then does a country deal with, with issues like that? That could also be a nice point of discussion. But the point, the bottom line is in Zim, it is housed within the IOC. And I've given you a link there where you can go and take a look and see how the Zim anti-doping rules look like. Okay. And then let's then move on to the court of arbitration for sport. This court was formed in 1984 to address some international sport disputes. Look, sport is a global industry. So at some point, there is going to be disputes internationally or across the ocean or outside of borders or however you want to describe it. Um, so CAS has to be an independent body. By independent, I mean independent of any and all government um, influence. Okay, so it is an independent body and all sport bodies recognize the jurisdiction of CAS. So it's got jurisdiction globally. Their, their judgment can encompass three or four countries or five countries, it doesn't matter. They do have jurisdiction over all those areas if it is related to sport. Okay, so they are also governed by the International Court of Arbitration for Sport, which is ICAS. Um, it was formed to make sure that there is no interference, no influence is exerted on CAS. And most of the people that work in CAS or for CAS are lawyers and judges, and most of them retired, but they do have quite a lot of experience in the legal um, field. Now, CAS is divided into two, two divisions, Ordinary Arbitration Division as well as the Appeals Arbitration Division. What's the difference? Ordinary Arbitration is when, say, for example, I'm an athlete and I have a, a dispute with my international federation. Let's say, for example, I play volleyball and I'm not happy with the International Volleyball Federation's judgment on, say, my doping case. So I will go to CAS and CAS is going to then be the arbitrator between myself and international volleyball to try and um, find out what's the issue and come to a, a, a peaceful resolution. For appeals, it's when, for example, FIFA has banned Ziffer from international competition and then Ziffer says, no, but that's unfair. Um, we want to appeal your decision. So they will then take that decision to the Court of Arbitration for Sport, where they will then arbitrate the original ruling by FIFA to find out if it was fair or not, should it be overturned, should it be upheld, and so on. Okay, so those are the two different aspects of the Court of Arbitration for Sport, which leads us to our first assignment. Okay, so there's a link there. Um, that link will lead you to a long article longish article it's not that long really it talks about the ruling made on the Custis Amenia case as well as I think a few other cases they might be Russia there as well the Russian Federation that we spoke about a little bit earlier and then you will have to answer some questions for that okay that is assignment number one it's actually quite an easy and quick assignment I'm trying to move a little bit quicker because I'm aware that videos um, take up a lot of space and could also be quite expensive to stream or maybe to download. All right, so let's come, let's bring it back home to Zim. We've looked at the global structure, the international structure. Now let's look at Zim's governing bodies or Zim's sports structure. We have right at the top, the Ministry of Youth, Sports, Arts and Recreation. And that is the overall governing mother body of all sports in the country. Directly under it, we have the Sports and Recreation Commission. And then it says under that there are delivery agents. Okay, and under those delivery agents, we have ZOC, uh, Special Olympics, and the National Paralympics Committee. And then beneath those, then we have 
our national sports associations, academies, gyms, and so on. Right, so these are the basic duties of these institutions, the Ministry of Youth, Sports, and so on. Um, they are responsible for the overall sport in the country, like we've already said, and they promote youth sports, arts, and culture, and you know who the minister is, Christy Coventry. The Sport and Recreation Commission, which is directly under the, the, the national government, um, it still reports to the Ministry of Youth, Sports, Arts, and Recreation, but it is a parastatal organization. Okay. Okay, so these are the delivery agents. Um, they include ZOC, Zimbabwe Olympic Committee, the National Paralympics, Special Olympics, as well as the National Sports Association. So those are the delivery agents, meaning that um, they are used by the SRC to deliver, be it funding, be it sporting, sporting expertise, guidance or whatnot to our then provincial, regional, and so on. All right, so our National Sport Associations, and I put pictures of the big ones there at the bottom. These ones are responsible for governing the respective sport codes. And these are very important associations because without them, then sport remains ungoverned and ungovernable. And that is where we find that sport becomes or fails to develop and grow. So they directly manage and promote development of sport in the country. And so all clubs must have an affiliation to the um, national sport associations who in turn must be compliant with registration to the Sport and Recreation Commission. All right, so I have mentioned earlier that I was looking for the uh, sport policy, which I then found at a later date. If you look at that sport policy, um, perhaps from, if you look at page four, it's, it talks about a case for sport and recreation. Okay, I'm sure we're all familiar with the reason why sport is important and why it must be implemented in the way that it is and so on. But it could help you to maybe go over that section and try and find out what it encompasses really. Um, they even go through to talk about sport volunteerism in this document, which is a very important element of sport because a lot of people that do take part in sport volunteer their time. And so volunteers are a very important element of sport. Um, then if you go on to page, uh, there's a page that I wanted us to talk about briefly. Um, page 13 gives a legal framework. So it tells you all the, the, the legal documents that make up the information that you find in the sport policy or that are formed, informed the sport policy in its formation. Um, the policy's goals and objectives those are found in page 18, as well as institutions that and their responsibilities in page 19 and 20 uh, through to 22. And right, page 23. This one then goes into the policy's priority areas. Okay, so they then mention a few areas that are a priority for sport in the country. And I think our interest is high performance, 9.6 on page 24. It says Zimbabwe shall ensure that a national high performance system is in place for all sport codes for the purpose of improving the quality of sport and recreation delivery and attaining elite level sport performance standards. Strategic external placements shall be afforded in areas of critical shortages and technical shortcomings. So the government, so what this basically means is that according to the policy, the government or the system in place has a responsibility to make sure that any and all sport enterprises have strategic placements and they target critical short um, areas of critical shortages and technical 
shortcomings. Interesting. So it, it, it then opens up opportunities then for us as sport practitioners to think about our enterprises and where they fit in and the role that the government can play in those instances. Hey, because their aim is to improve the quality and delivery of sport and that is where we come in. Quality and delivery, we know the business management aspect of it. So we can certainly bring the quality and the delivery should also then follow in that respect. And then if you look at page 25, um, when we did the first lecture introduction to management, we looked at the hierarchy of sport and we had, I think, professional sport rights at the apex. Okay, so they have it a little bit different here because they've then brought it down to national level, which is brilliant, it's great. And we should be able to relate these two um, pyramids to each other. Okay, so right at the bottom of our pyramid, we had education sport, and they're making it simple here. They're telling you this is school and community sport at ward level. And then the next one becomes then district centers of sporting excellence. Okay, those are still schools. And then the next one becomes provincial centers of sporting excellence, which are local authorities. Now, to be honest with you, I have yet to encounter any of these institutions, any and all of them, even the National Academy, I have yet to see at work or functioning, but perhaps you have a little bit more experience than I do with these institutions. Please share if you do, let us know how they work, uh, where are they situated if they are, and if you look at the bottom there, they do talk a little bit about privately owned academies um, and how they should be run. So these are things that will then influence your sport enterprise as a sport practitioner. Um, it tells you how to register, which SRC Act and chapter you need to be aware of, um, how the Ministry of Sports rules and laws are going to influence you, particularly in terms of competitions, um, programs and games and um, on page 26 they talk about the regulation and the facilitation of industry enterprises so that's quite important as well now you will need to refer to this policy in your group assignment as well as in the exam. So it's best to familiarize yourself with it, be able to understand what they're talking about, how it influences sport enterprises, their growth, their development, how it hinders them, um, and also be able to make suggestions. Perhaps this would be better here and there. So critiquing it is a good way of showing your understanding of the document. So like I said, I want to keep this video short so that I do not waste your data um i think i'm gonna end it here for today and we will talk again in our next lecture have a good day bye everybody